Hello, everyone. On behalf of BIC Alliance, publisher of BIC Magazine, and our webinar sponsor, Structural, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's event, Foundation Repair and Maintenance Strategies. This is Mark Herzog from BIC Magazine. Before I introduce the webinar, a few tips on navigating the presentation console on your screen. You can resize or hide any of the windows. For example, you can maximize the slide presentation window. At the bottom, you will see widgets to access resources, including a Q&A link to submit questions during the presentation. There's a green widget which has resources on the topic that you might want to download, including a PDF of the slide deck for your future reference. If during the presentation there's some small type that you can't see, you'll be able to see that uh, after the webinar in a PDF. If you experience any audio or other technical problems, click on the yellow question mark icon, and that will give you some FAQs for uh, helping your technical problem. So again, thanks for being here to join us for this webinar. Equipment foundation repair and maintenance strategies is a topic that can be discussed in great detail, but today will be a short overview that will provide some high-level insight on repair and maintenance of foundations for rotating and reciprocating equipment. Our agenda is to quickly cover some equipment foundation basics, then walk you through an ideal repair process followed by some case studies of that process in action. We will close by sharing some maintenance strategies and have some time for a Q&A at the end. Both of our speakers today work for structural group companies whose mission is to make both new and existing structures stronger and last longer. Structural group companies deliver turnkey solutions that integrate technology, engineering, and construction from offices across the United States, as well as the Middle East. Our speakers are both experts in foundations and the industrial environment. Jonathan Summer is a division manager with Structural, the contracting arm of Structural Group. Based in Houston, jo uh, Jonathan has been with Structural for over 12 years and leads planning and implementation of all equipment foundation projects. Tom Klein is the Director of Concrete Repair Solutions with Structural Technologies, the products and engineering arm of Structural Group. Tom is also based in Houston and for over 35 years has been involved in the investigation and repair of civil and structural infrastructure, primarily for industrial and energy clients. As they go through the presentation, again, we encourage you to submit any questions that will be addressed at the end. With that, I turn it over to Tom to get us started. Thanks, Mark. And I'm going to quickly give some basic background information on equipment foundations, and primarily I'm going to use ACI 351. Now, ACI is an acronym for the American Concrete Institute Committee for Equipment and Machinery Foundations. Now, according to ACI, there are three categories of equipment and machinery, with uh, the most common uh, in petrochemical facilities being rotating and reciprocating equipment. What's important to understand about uh, this type of equipment is that it uh, transmits dynamic forces, and these forces need to get to the ground. So that's why these foundations are so important uh, to both understand uh, and if there are problems, develop and understand the root cause. Now, we talked about the different types of equipment, but there are also many different types of foundations that uh, found these structures and then deliver those uh, forces to the ground. But primarily, we'll be looking at the top three, the block, combined block, and pile foundations. And as seen here, uh, these are the most common and uh, the top three. Now, while each foundation is unique, here are some common components that make up the foundation system. Now, all of these components are very important for vibration dampening, alignment, and the overall reliability of the equipment. Well, let's now walk you through a structured process in order to make effective repair so, uh, 
decisions and solutions. Now the repair process uh, initially starts where we have to make a decision on whether we're going to repair or we're going to wait and monitor or sometimes known as wait and see. Now this essentially flow chart is telling us that when we're dealing with existing infrastructure, we want our clients to consider a wider range of factors beyond the cause and effect before deciding on a strategy or repair technique. And when we look at that, there's actually a structured process that involves a condition assessment and analysis that's always going to result in developing the best repair strategy and execution of the repair. Now when we look at uh, the condition assessment, I'm sorry about this. When we look at the condition assessment, what we're trying to determine is really the root cause of the problems. The repair analysis is going to determine the available resources and expectations the customer might have then obviously we're trying to develop an, appro an appropriate repair strategy to achieve the desired results. Now the next group of slides that we're going to walk you through uh, is going to be of this repair process and it's going to be specific to the equipment foundations. Now when uh, we're talking about uh, process driven problems, uh, this could be in the range when we're talking about a change of use where there might be larger pieces of equipment put onto the foundations, which would be our change of use, or it could be equipment failures that cause foundation damage. And many times we get into these facilities and it, there'll be uh, change or you know, issues that we have to address that could be the result of uh, explosions or fires. Now there's also terms of long-term deterioration, and those are problems from operational or environmental conditions. And again, we look at things like dynamic load effects and the exposure to harsh chemicals and high temperatures. And, uh, you know, obviously there are also things that are associated with original design defects. Uh, and also with the uh, selection of the original materials of construction and then also just the craftsmanship issues uh, that could be, uh, uh, you know, a result. And it's important to understand these three uh, can all ultimately compound each other and cause problems with the foundation. Now, when we're looking at uh, defects in design and construction. Many times we're looking at anchor bolts, and we'll discuss this more in detail later in the presentation, but the selection of the wrong type or size of the anchor bolts can call, cause significant cracking and excess vibration. Now the grout, and again these issues are also going to be talked about uh, later in the presentation but they also can be re related to not only the wrong selection of the grout materials, but also in the craftsmanship. And as can be seen from this, draw, this uh, photo here, uh, there's actually an issue uh, with craftsmanship and, and during the grouting process. And then the overall foundation design and things like the shape of the foundation potentially being insufficient and also uh, the reinforcement of the foundation blocks many times are, are common uh, design deficiencies. And as I stated before, many of these problems compound uh, each other and uh, cause significant issues with uh, long-term durability. Now, uh, you know, equipment-driven issues like uh, vibrations, uh, bearing and seal issues, and these are usually detected on a regular basis through a program known as, uh, you know, RBI, risk-based inspection programs. But if conditions persist and it's seen that uh, the equipment itself is not uh, problematic, uh, then we start looking uh, down at the foundation and that's the next place that uh, we're really seeking to try to alleviate some of these problems. Now the equipment damage uh, you know, can be on the failure of the foundation as a primary uh, repair driver. And a change in uh, equipment is very common, as we stated earlier, as a driver for upgrades to these foundations. 
Now, uh, if it's determined that the repair is needed, the best course of action is to perform a condition assessment. Now, when we're looking at a condition assessment, the real purpose is to gather and evaluate data and then to provide a clear understanding of the structure's current condition, the extent of damage, and determine the root cause of the damage. Now, uh, every foundation can be assessed right off the bat with looking at historical data and a visual inspection without impacting the operation. And this visual inspection are things like looking at the concrete blocks, the chocks and grout, and bolt inspection. And, and these are things that uh, are not problematic while it's online. But if we need to do a series of non-destructive testing, NDT, or semi-destructive testing, we really need uh, to find out uh, you know, if we can do these uh, tests and it's not going to affect the operation, but the result of these tests provide us with a significant amount of information in the form of the extent of damage, uh, the understanding of the physical and chemical properties of the materials of original construction, and whether it was even constructed as was originally designed. Now, the repair analysis is the stage of the process that looks at the project variables and expectations to help steer to uh, you know, an eventual selection of the proper repair strategy. And uh, what should uh, it include as part of its repair analysis are understanding project constraints and very frank discussions on how much time and money is available and then can, it be, can, the, can the piece of equipment actually be removed from operation or shut down? And then the final question is, can the equipment actually be removed from its foundation? So in order to better understand this, we would actually start looking at the repair strategy. Uh, and the repair strategy, uh, I'm going to hand the baton over now to Jonathan Summer to talk more in depth. Uh, regarding this very important topic. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, there are many solutions for equipment foundation repair. Uh, based on the specific needs of a project, one or several of these solutions may provide a desired result. But a true repair strategy goes beyond just the materials and technology involved. A true repair strategy can, considers three areas, proper design of the foundation, including conventional reinforcement designs and overall shape of the foundation that can help control foundation stability and, du and durability. Um, material selection is key. One or several techniques may be utilized, but it's very important to also choose materials that are suitable for the particular environment and exposure conditions by project. Um, later on in this presentation, we're going to discuss anchor bolts and grout in more detail. Uh, means and methods are all about ensuring a quality installation. Um, even though you've got the best materials and design, it will not provide the intended results if not installed properly. Uh, grouting is a very important piece of equipment foundation system. It provides key fun it's, excuse me, it provides several key functions. Uh, to transmit the force of the equipment to the foundation and to maintain the level and alignment of the equipment. Um, here in this slide, you can see this green highlighted area is the area between the uh, concrete foundation and uh, the base of the equipment. Um, as that uh, equipment is uh, level and aligned, um, that grout is installed um, inside of that area between the base plate and the concrete. Uh, when we look at the grout, there are several physical and chemical properties that we need to be aware of. We need to match them to the operating requirements and the machinery they support. Um, the last two on this list, the coefficient of thermal expansion and the flowability and bearing area are, are key points that need to be understood uh, with the grout that's being installed and, uh, and uh, how it's going to affect the overall installation of the equipment and the uh, overall service of the equipment and foundation. Um, epoxy grouts are better suited for equipment installations compared to cementitious grouts. Unlike cementitious grouts that will soak and absorb fluids, epoxy grouts are more like plastic and more inert. 
um, high strength. They have a high strength and minimal shrinkage, and are resistant to chemical attack, as we just, as we discussed earlier. And they have a, a, a higher vibration dampening effect um, as that those dynamic forces are transmitted through the base plate or the the base of the equipment um, through that grout and then into the concrete. Um, the installation of epoxy grouts is very important. Um, surface must be dry and clean and properly prepared by uh, chipping the uh, chipping the top surface, uh, removing the latents and a portion of that concrete. Um, seal surfaces of the base or the compressor uh, need to be clean and properly prepared. Um, all the e perimeter edges need to be chamfered. Um, expansions, expansion joints are very important on the installation to ensure uh, that you're minimizing cracking um, after, the, uh, after the equipment is put into service. Um, the equipment should be supported and leveled using uh, leveling screws or jack bolts. And it's very important to uh, condition the material um, to between, um, ideally between 60 or 80 degrees. Um, but understanding the effects on very cold temperatures or very warm temperatures on how the uh, how the grout reacts um, in those placements. Um, next, we're going to move on to anchor bolts. Um, anchor bolts are another key component of the foundation system. Their job is to hold the equipment to the foundation and transmit the loads to the ground, obviously through the foundation into the ground. Uh, proper tensioning in the bolt will provide enough force to resist horizontal forces created by the equipment itself. For many years, there's a lack of understanding on what happens to the foundation at the anchor bolt termination. Uh, foundations designed prior to the 1980s utilized bolts, um, you can see here on the left. Um, so J bolts, L bolts, um, bolts with uh, plates at the bottom are still um, being used today um, quite often. Um, uh, another key point here um, is that um, the type of termination is important, which we'll get into um, uh, a little bit further on in the presentation. Um, understanding the, the relationship between tension and torquing the nut on that anchor. Um, common practice is to allow 12 bolt diameters for free stretch um, at the top of the bolt. Um, also, there are numerous different ways to repair or replace bolts, and those kind of uh, at a project-by-project uh, project basis is um, if they can be repaired or replaced. Um, in recent years, the terminations have been thoroughly researched. Um, as we know, concrete is very strong in compression. Um, in the green area here, you can see the cone of compression. Um, and then at the termination of the bolt, it creates a, uh, a very high tension zone. Um, in that concrete. Um, at that tension zone, depending on the type of termination, you can get, um, you can get more cracking um, in that area. And it's important to have that, uh, that foundation designed with enough reinforcing steel around those anchor bolt tension, or excuse me, anchor bolt terminations to be able to control that cracking. Um, here's a, a picture representing showing those horizontal cracks um, that were in a foundation um, down near the anchor bolt terminations. Um, if you've got poor um, rebar detailing, um, you can get movement across those cracks, um, actually um, parting the block horizontally and not making that uh, foundation monolithic anymore. Uh, before the 1980s, pull-out strength was a primary factor utilized when determining uh, the anchor bolts. Um, what wasn't considered was the stresses that the bolts were creating. Um, J bolts and L bolts um, will typically pull out before the yield stress, yield stress of the materials reached. Um, and also, uh, uh, bolts with plate washers, um, square plate washers in the bottom, um, create um, increased tensile stresses in that concrete, causing cracks. Modern-day bolt designs, um, the terminations have changed, reducing the tensile stresses um, in the concrete, um, trying to uh, put that anchor bolt termination far down deep in, into the block as possible. Um, the uh, typical yield strength of the materials is higher. Um, bolts these days, will, um, especially on um, larger equipment, will need to have rolled threads um, versus cut threads. Um, and then we're trying to make the bolt now as long as possible to maximize stretch, stretch for the applied tension. 
Um, and then we're enlarging that cone of compression and putting the maximum amount of block into compression to help uh, manage uh, the uh, dynamic forces that are being put on the foundation by the equipment. Um, next, we're going to discuss means and methods. Um, for means and methods, there's a wide variety of factors to consider, especially when working in industrial facilities. As mentioned earlier, the best materials and best specifications and designs will not carry out their intended function without, install, without being installed properly. Um, we'll address some of those details, both design and construction, as we review a couple of case studies. Uh, the case studies I share today will refer to the repair process as we outlined uh, earlier that, that Tom discussed. Um, this uh, project right here, um, this uh, piece of equipment was installed um, directly after installation and bringing the, a piece of equipment into service. Uh, the owner uh, noticed excessive vibration. Um, the, uh, the, the Equipment manufacturer was brought in and the equipment was looked at. And all the mechanicals were in proper working order. Um, it was determined that the equipment could no longer be um, in service with the amount of vibration that it was seeing um, without damage. Um, at that point, there was a determination that the, uh, the, the, the grout was not installed correctly. Uh, scope of uh, work was determined to be uh, removing the machinery, removing the grout. Uh, creating a surface, proper surface profile onto that concrete, um, installing a series of mechanical anchors for the grout, installing expansion joints, uh, setting and aligning and leveling the equipment, and then installing a uh, full bed of epoxy grout. Um, as you can see, as this equipment was uh, pulled off the base, uh, none of the epoxy grout that was installed underneath the base actually bonded to the base. None of it pulled off with it. Um, the next picture here shows a four-foot level um, across that foundation. Um, the contractor that installed the grout most likely installed the grout from all around the perimeter of the foundation instead of having the grout flow from one side of the foundation to the other, ensuring that there's no air trapped and ensuring that there's intimate contact with the bottom of the pump base. Um, also, a couple things to note here. Uh, you can see the preparation of the concrete uh, or lack thereof and that this grout was, kept, was coming up in uh, very large chunks. You can see how it's delaminated there um, and there was very little bond of that epoxy grout to the existing concrete. Um, after all of the uh, epoxy grout was removed, the existing epoxy grout, um, a uh, very uh, angular profile, what we like to call peaks and valleys, of approximately three quarters to one inch um, was created using pneumatic chipping guns. Uh, you, we have broken aggregate, which you can see here, which uh, API standards uh, also reference. Um, a series of mechanical anchors, uh, these are uh, uh, just typical uh, reinforcing steel rebar um, that's in the shape of a U that's epoxied into the top of the foundation. Um, there is a, a series around the perimeter of the foundation as long uh, also uh, down the middle of the foundation. Um, as we discussed earlier, um, epoxy grouts and concrete have different coefficients of thermal expansion. Um, so this helps control uh, edge lifting around the perimeter of the foundation and also uh, provides a uh, mechanical bond of the epoxy grout um, along with the um, normal surface bond of the epoxy grout. Um, after the equipment was set into place, um, a series of expansion joints were put in place. Uh, the anchor bolts were, uh, were wrapped to uh, get as much free stretch as we could. Um, there you can see the mechanical anchors. Uh, you can see the equipment sitting on uh, jack bolts on uh, jack bolt pads. Uh, here is during here is the uh, grouting um, application. Uh, head box were used from one side of the foundation um, to push the grout underneath the base and completely fill uh, the void between the base and the concrete and to ensure that we had intimate contact uh, between the base plate and the grout. 
Uh, moving on to a, uh, the next case study, um, this was a two-throw reciprocating compressor. Um, the uh, client noticed severe cracking and, uh, both in the foundation um, and the grout. Um, there was a, uh, evidence of excessive frame movement, um, which affected the acceptable uh, alignment of the equipment. Uh, the uh, equipment was installed in the early 1960s. It had been regrouted several times in the past. Um, it had L-shaped anchor bolts of unknown grade. Uh, the owner was unable to maintain uh, tension on those bolts. Uh, the operators would come and uh, put torque on the nuts on those anchors, and within a few days they would be able to come back and that nut would be loose again. Um, that's typically a sign that that L bolt or J bolt is actually straightening and pulling itself uh, out of the foundation. Uh, like we mentioned before, there's significant uh, cracking um, throughout the foundation. Um, here's a picture uh, with a small diagram showing the outline of the foundation. Uh, the, the, the foundation actually followed the uh, outline of the of the compressor where you've got the frame down the middle and your frame extensions, the uh, perimeter of the foundation followed that outline. Uh, the, at the re-entrant corners there was cracking uh, that's uh, detailed by that black line that goes across that diagram uh, where the foundation was actually split in half um, from that crack, uh, separating the foundation and making it into two pieces. Um, there was very uh, little cover um, over the anchor bolts um, on this foundation. Um, also very little reinforcing steel around the, uh, just around the perimeter of the foundation, um, just under the concrete cover. Uh, so there was quite a bit of cracking um, at the anchor bolts. Um, repair strategy was to remove uh, third, the top 30 inches of the foundation. That's pretty much from, um, from grade uh, to the bottom of the frame of the compressor. Uh, it was also decided to reconfigure the shape of the foundation, as you can see in the red hatched area. That was where the foundation was uh, squared up and uh, made larger to uh, increase the cover over the, uh, over the anchor bolts and to get rid of the reentrant corners. Um, it was decided to uh, reinforce the uh, foundation um, with, uh, you can see the new anchor bolts that were installed. Um, there was post vertical post tensioning, uh, those are actual threaded bars that were installed, and then horizontal uh, post tensioning cables that were put uh, across the foundation in both directions. Um, also, uh, one thing to note on this is that there, there was a uh, engineered uh, work package that was put together um, uh, detailing um, all of the, uh, all, everything that was, was going into that, uh, that repair with materials, reinforcing steel, um, the, the type of anchor bolts that were installed, that was all detailed in the engineered package. Um, the concrete was poured back with a, a polymer modified uh, concrete. Uh, the surface was prepared, the uh, compressor was set and aligned, and a uh, full bed of grout was installed. Uh, going through some pictures of the installation, this is after uh, the block was removed. It was actually uh, taken out with a, a diamond wire saw and uh, large blocks of the concrete were removed um, after it was, uh, after it was uh, separated from the uh, rest of the concrete. Uh, this drawing shows the vertical dowels being installed. Uh, those are approximately six inches of centers. Uh, the bottom mat of uh, reinforcing steel is also installed. Uh, the post-tension bolts that are going down to the mat foundation um, are sleeved and there's a block out uh, created at the top um, so those can be tensioned after the concrete is placed. Um, all of the reinforcing steel at this point is installed. Um, the formwork for the concrete placement is in place. Um, there's a stainless steel oil pan that is installed under the frame of the compressor to help uh, catch and can contain uh, any drips and spills or anything coming off of the compressor. Um, key thing in this picture is the, uh, the, the fabricated steel anchor bolt template. Um, prior to the equipment being removed from the foundation, it was, uh, it was shot in optically to get the as-found conditions um, along with uh, elevation and orientation 
Uh, anchor bolts were also shot, so their exact position was known. Uh, the steel, uh, uh, steel anchor bolt template was fabricated and installed and then shot in optically also to ensure that the anchor bolts uh, were in the exact same location as, uh, as they were before. Uh, this, uh, is, this picture shows uh, after the concrete has been placed, uh, these are actually the, the, the forms for the grout placement. Um, expansion joints are installed throughout the foundation. Um, this uh, project uh, actually had the vertical dowels um, were exposed, or actually came up out of the top of the concrete um, to provide a mechanical bond for the grout. Um, the uh, machine is uh, set and aligned and leveled. Uh, the bottom of the frame was left uh, with a exposed metal finish that was sandblasted, and you can see it was coated in there, and that's actually where uh, the equipment was grouted up to, as you'll see in the in the next photograph here. So that's after the the grout was installed, and then the final uh, final picture here. Um, one one thing to note. Um, that this uh, does show, uh, it, it appears to be you know, 18 to 24 inches of grout, um, but, but that is not the case. I'll, I'll go back to the uh, picture, or excuse me, the drawing uh, of the foundation, and this particular uh, project called for uh, an overpour, so there was actually an uh, inch and a half to two inches of concrete that were chipped in on the sides of the foundation to allow that grout to flow down the sides of the foundation, and that's an, another method that can be used to um, try to eliminate uh, edge lifting. And going back to uh, pictures of the form, formwork, you can actually see this uh, pink foam board that was installed uh, to um, uh, allow uh, the grout to go down the sides. And after the concrete forms were removed, uh, that um, that grout was prepared all the way down the sides, and uh, that's what actually gives that that uh, that look of having that that thick of grout. Um, we wanted to review a couple of uh, maintenance tips uh, that we would suggest um, for these foundations. Um, we would suggest um, adding these as part of normal equipment inspection program. Um, so you're, you're most likely going to be monitoring the vibration, the alignment of the equipment. Um, it would be a good idea to check the uh, anchor bolts that are securing the, the base or the compressor uh, to the foundation, um, checking to ensure they have proper tension and loading, uh, making sure they're not uh, being corroded, um, checking the condition of the grout, uh, looking for um, cracking, edge lifting, um, any signs of it uh, failing. Um, it's important to manage leaks, um, regularly clean the foundation and equipment base. Uh, some of the pumps that are in service uh, uh, handle pretty harsh chemicals. Um, if you've got seals that are leaking and exposing that foundation to those chemicals, you could get uh, premature wear and failure uh, of the foundation due to those chemicals. Uh, and then monitoring cracks um, in the foundation. Uh, this picture is actually a... Um, a cylinder, cylinder support, uh, bottle support uh, shelf. Uh, as you can see, there's a crack that's going, that's uh, coming down this side of this foundation, and you can see that a, a, a crack monitor was used to uh, measure the width of the cracks. Um, and then also part part of the condition survey. Um, also, uh, we could, as the um, as the condition of the foundation is, is monitored and also um, uh, understood at a certain period of time, um, as you go back to that foundation, you could look at where the cracking was and what the width of the cracking was and try to make a determination if the condition of the foundation is getting worse or if it's maintaining. And that can also help you in, in deciding um, whether repair needs to happen sooner or later. Um, at this time, I uh, wanted to uh, go into uh, some questions and uh, answers. And we're going to pull those up right now. Um, got a question here. I think would be um, would good be good for Tom to uh, to answer. The, the question is, Tom, are you there, Tom? Yes, I'm here, Jonathan. 
Okay, the, the question is, uh, is there a way to determine exactly how much service life a foundation has left? That, that's a great question, Jonathan, and um, the only way that we can even try to get a handle on that is to initiate a condition assessment. Uh, this way we can take a look at the materials of construction and any ongoing deterioration mechanisms that are going on. So that's not only that visual inspection, but it's also going to be a uh, you know, macroscopic inspection, which might involve some microseismic uh, non-destructive testing in the form of uh, impact echo or pulse velocity, but also uh, some sample collection would be recommended so that we could understand the chemical characteristics of the concrete and whether there's any ongoing uh, deterioration. And then obviously also the physical characteristics, uh, whether the original uh, concrete was actually in compliance and has uh, you know, the physical properties necessary in the form of compressive strength. Um, other than that, it's really kind of like operating in the dark. So we definitely recommend a condition assessment to try to get an idea about uh, opportunities in service life extension. Great question. Thank you, Tom. And now, Jonathan, I have one for you, uh, which uh, came in and it says, can repairs be done with the equipment in operation? That's, that's a good question, and, and we get that a lot. Um, uh, the, the alignment um, and the levelness of the equipment is typically, typically critical, so there's, there's not too much that can be done with the equipment um, in service. Uh, there are some repairs that can be done um, uh, somewhat cosmetic, excuse me, uh, co uh, cosmetic or kind of housekeeping of, of grout as far as removing and replacing grout that's, that's delaminated. Um, so sometimes we can remove some grout um, underneath, underneath the machine. Obviously all this has to be done with the, with the equipment um, out of service or down. Um, anchor, some anchor bolts can be replaced uh, depending on uh, the, the, uh, the I guess the overall size and, and shape of the foundation and where those anchor bolts are in relation to the uh, to the edges of the foundation, um, but typically no repairs can be done with the equipment um, in service. Um, some repairs can be done on a case by case basis with the equipment still in place, um, but typically to properly repair a foundation or regrout a machine. Um, the, the equipment does need to be taken um, um, off offline. Um, I would like okay. to remind the attendees. What, I, I would like to uh, remind the attendees that um, if you would like to um, would like to ask any questions, to um, ask those in the uh, there's a Q and A section where you can type in your questions. Uh, Tom, there's right. a now question there here. About are you looking about the, how, how critical the type of concrete used for foundation yes. repairs? Yes, I, I did notice that. And we've been talking a lot about uh, things like uh, the use of epoxies for epoxy grout. But this one uh, appears to be, uh, you know, the type of concrete that's used for foundation repairs. And that's, that's a commonly asked question. And what we like to try to do is make sure that the concrete that we're using for foundation repairs uh, closely matches uh, the concrete in uh, behavior that uh, constitutes the foundation. Uh, primarily that's why we recommend doing a condition assessment because the, uh, the concrete may have been originally specified to be uh, you know, three to 5,000 PSI, but if the foundation is particularly old, uh, it could be much higher than that. Uh, many times concrete will gain strength over time in the presence of, uh, you know, moisture and, and warm temperature. So we're trying to match the, uh, you know, characteristics, and a lot of it is strength because it's modulus of elasticity also. And uh, with that, uh, if the concrete is, uh, you know, has now risen to an 8,000 PSI concrete, we're going to try to repair it with a concrete that's very similar. Now, uh, probably, Jonathan, it makes sense to also indicate uh, why an epoxy grout is a good selection uh, for founding the equipment, and I'll give that one to you. 
Yes. Um, are you referring to the, the question on what, what the what the cure time is required for the epoxy versus concrete? Is that correct? Y yes, along those lines, yes. Okay. Um, one second. These questions are coming in pretty quick. Um, so there's a question on what the what is the cure time required for epoxy versus concrete. Um, um, so I guess I'll first address the concrete. So there's uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of different types of concrete mixes. Um, typical concrete takes 28 days to uh, outgas. And what that outgas is is actually as the, the concrete's curing, the uh, water that is in that concrete that uh, hydrates the cement is uh, is actually leaving the foundation. Um, it's very critical for all for all that moisture, excessive moisture, to be out of that concrete um, because epoxy grouts don't uh, uh, don't do well uh, with moisture or moisture on the surface. So you can actually affect. Uh, the installation if that concrete is wet or if the concrete is not uh, properly uh, properly cured. Now there are concretes that are very fast setting. Um, there are concretes that can be can be placed and grouted uh, within 24 hours. Um, typically on a, uh, a schedule for a repair project, especially if this equipment's out of service and offline, um, it's very critical to get it back into service quickly. So those. Uh, concretes uh, with a 24-hour cure are typically used when concrete repair is needed. Um, epoxies, on the other hand, um, cure uh, quite a bit faster than uh, traditional concrete, um, depending, and it's, it's mostly dependent on temperature. Um, so it's a, a chemical reaction with the with the resin and the hardener. And as those two are reacting, if you do get cool temperatures, that could actually uh, retard that uh, that cure time and that chemical reaction. Uh, so that's one one reason you want to try to maintain a, a temperature between 60 and 80 degrees when placing these materials. Is to uh, one, if it's too cool, it'll slow down the cure time, and then if it's too hot, it uh, it, it can uh, affect the um, affect the installation to where the materials are setting off too fast and you're not getting the flow that you need. Um, so the epoxy grouts do cure um, quite a bit faster than concrete typically, but it's important to understand the epoxy grout and how temperature affects that cure time. That's that's a great answer, Jonathan. Now, there was another question, and uh, probably we should be looking at this as trying to wrap up, uh, and we'll take this one last question, and it's, uh, it's an interesting question because it says, I see that in the rebar uh, that's in the slides uh, that it wasn't coated, that there was no epoxy coating, and the thought would be that the epoxy coating uh, would help alleviate potentially some cracking or some embedded metal corrosion uh, and uh, and added is, uh, you know, thinking of concrete cancer, things like uh, carbonation and uh, delaminated concrete. And uh, Jonathan, have you ever been in a situation where you've epoxy coated uh, the wickets or any of the the rebar in your repair? Uh, I, I have, I have not. And and honestly, um, and, unless there's an extreme lack of concrete cover, um, most uh, most larger reciprocating uh, compressor foundations and and pump foundations um, I rarely come across embedded metal corrosion being being an issue. So I think the, the important thing there is to ensure that um, your rebar is properly protected with the appropriate amount of concrete cover. And I think that gets kind of back in the means and methods is ensuring that the contractor that's doing the work understands that and are forming the uh, foundations and repairs uh, to ensure that you've got a long-lasting uh, foundation. Right, and I think a, a big part of it is also that the new concrete repair materials are typically, uh, even though they're polymer modified, they have a highly alkaline environment. So the idea is that's going to put any embedded reinforcing steel into a passive environment which is going to keep it from corroding. So excellent yes. question, but probably uh, another reason why we don't see that uh, epoxy coating. So uh, with that, I want to thank uh, everybody and, uh, at BIC 
and also my co-presenter, uh, Jonathan. And uh, Mark, are there any closing words? Yes. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, on behalf of BIC, I'd like to thank Structural again for sponsoring this great content. If anyone wants to contact Structural, there is a contact us button at the bottom, which essentially is to email info at structural.net. That's structural.net. And certainly you can always go to their website as well. Again, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. If you asked a question that did not get answered today, the group will respond to you individually. We have record of who asked what question. And if you want to submit questions in the meantime, uh, after, I should say, after the webinar, you can use that info at structural.net to do so. Thank you again, everyone. You can watch this webinar again beginning in a few hours at bicwebinars.com. We ask you to also share it through your social media. Everyone, have a great day and a safe day. Thank you.